Those of you that are here this morning know that we are pretty much continuing uh, with the subject matter. This morning I taught a, a doctrinal sermon on the Trinity, and um, we're going to be continuing that. And, and this evening, though, what I'm going to be focusing more on, this morning what I was trying to do was just to explain the concept from Scripture of the fact that there are three distinct persons that, are, that make up the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, and just, just kind of explain the concept, explain what we believe about the Trinity from Scripture. And what I want to do this evening is really go a little bit more in depth on some verses that um, specifically have been brought up recently from people who, I believe, believe modalism or oneness Pentecostalism. Now, I've heard people say, oh, it's a false accusation because these guys don't believe. And I'm not going to get involved in bringing up all the people who you know, say this or that. It doesn't matter to me at this point. I don't care. But my answer to that, though, is just, you know, oh, it's a false accusation. What do you do when, when someone says that they believe you have to repent of all of your sins to be saved? Do you call that a works-based salvation? I do. But you know what? The person who says you have to repent of all your sins, oh, no, no, you just don't understand. See, I, this is different. It's not works-based salvation because you have to, you know, and, and they'll go on all the reasons why it's not works-based salvation when it's works-based salvation. So what's been happening is the people that believe in this modalism nonsense and oneness, they tweak it a little bit and they try to say, oh, no, but see, you don't understand because of this and this and this and try to move things around a little bit. And it's like, you know what? You're still saying what they're saying using some different words. It's still the same concept. It's still the same doctrine and belief, okay? And what I want to do this evening, and, you know, in the, in the almost four years I've been preaching, I haven't had to do this that I could recall one time. But I went back, and, and you know, when, when all this stuff came up, obviously there's, there's a big deal about it. I personally have, have believed in the Trinity doctrine for as long as I can remember. But um, I think because I've, I've just kind of held to that truth for so long, and I've never really had it challenged before because it's so widely accepted. I mean, this is a doctrine that permeates, you know, not just Baptists, but like, I mean, almost, almost all of Christianity is something that's very widely held. It just is. So because of that, I haven't really been too challenged on it. And when you're not challenged on something, you know, you could get kind of sloppy or lazy, I guess, in, 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 in how you understand things. So in a sense, with all this stuff that happened, even though there's a lot of bad things, personally, I'm kind of glad that, that different, you know, because I was listening, I, I, you know, I always give people a benefit of just being able to hear someone out and listen to them on stuff, right? And it was able to challenge me. And I actually found some contradiction in the way that I had originally understood the Trinity. So I have to make it public now because I had taught incorrectly in the past on what I believe is, is accurate and truly consistent doctrine. Now, it's not some major thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of more of a tweak to just the understanding of the, of the Godhead. But um, we're going to get into some of the passages and, and the reason why I think I was a little bit off, and I mentioned this this morning, is that we get so focused on proving the deity of Jesus Christ because that has always been where the attack has been coming from, is from people like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and stuff that they want to attack and say, no, Jesus Christ is just a man. And you're saying, no, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And he is, amen. I mean, there's, there's absolutely. And in so doing and always focusing on that, there were a few aspects that or verses that I, that I don't believe say specifically that, right? Where you start to, to believe things that will, um, not that Jesus isn't God, but, but um, well, let me, I'll deal with them all when I get to the verses specifically, okay? Isaiah 9, 6 is one of them. We're going to cover Isaiah 9, 6, and I'm going to cover what I think is, is biblically consistent and accurate with a, an understanding of that verse, because I do not believe, and the title of my sermon this, this evening is Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Father. Okay, when we're talking about the, the, the three parts of the, of the Godhead, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are not the same as each other. 
They are one God. And again, I don't want to re-preach this morning's sermon. They are one God, but extreme, you know, I don't even say extremely, but they, they definitely are distinct. And, and I call them persons. And you know, again, I, I, I covered all that this morning. So if you missed this morning's sermon, please look at that. But what happened is, is um, and what I think does happen is that people have a hard time with a few verses in the Bible. And this is common with, with all kinds of false doctrines. But we always do, what we always do here is we look at the whole, the whole of Scripture, and if you have a mountain of evidence that's all pointing one way, right? And then you have one or two verses that seemingly contradict that or seem to say something different that would lead you down, well, wait, if this is true, then you, know, you start really going off into a whole other direction than what the rest of the Bible is saying. We go with, we, we hold true to the, to the mountain of evidence and just say, I need to pray that I could just understand these a little bit more fully and, and that, that there's something I'm not quite getting if it seems to be a contradiction. Perfect example of that, James 2, right? I mean, you have a mountain of evidence saying that salvation is by grace, through faith, not of works, you know, over and over in so many different ways we find that in Scripture just time after time after time again. And then you get to James 2 and says, you know, faith without works is dead. You know, if a man say he has faith, can faith save him? There's a question, right? And what some people do, oh man, well maybe it is works. Maybe, you know, and they just, just really go off the deep end with that because there's one verse that they don't quite understand. One small section of scripture. We stick with the, with the, with the evidence. Okay, and that's what, that's what I believe, you know, I showed a lot this morning on the Trinity doctrine and how distinct and how, you know, Jesus is talking to the Father and, and, and you know, he, his, you know, not my will but thine be done and you see different wills and stuff. So we see all this stuff and it's extremely clear. Amen. So we're going to go with that. I mean, when you read through, especially the New Testament, I mean, especially you read the New Testament cover to cover, you see more than anything, you see the distinction between the Godhead then you see the unity of the Godhead. You really see them in their components way more as like separate than you see them as one. We have multiple verses that, that do tie them together, of course, because that is true as well, that there's one God. But when you look at the preponderance of the evidence, it, it by far just, just proves that the Trinity is, is, a, is a valid, true doctrine. And I think that's why it's been so widely accepted, even by people who aren't even, you know, we don't even consider to be saved. Because it's so basic and fundamental. I mean, even people who teach work salvation will tell you it's not of works because it's so clear in the Bible, right? Even people, you know, people get some other things wrong, they'll still say certain things and they'll still believe on these things because it's just so evident. And I believe the Trinity is one of those doctrines. And it's what, that's why I preached this morning. It's one of our foundational, uh, fundamental beliefs that we have here. Now, there is a belief that the main distinction in the Trinity, this comes from that oneness belief, is the distinction with the man, Jesus Christ, as opposed to the rest of the Godhead. That that is kind of the primary distinction when it comes to any distinctions and that... Um, you know, they try to explain away a lot of these verses saying, oh, well, that's because it's the man and it's not the, you know, and, and not the rest of the Godhead. But it's still, that doesn't even make sense um, because the distinctions within the Godhead did not begin with G when Jesus Christ was born. They didn't start when he became flesh. Because Jesus always existed and, you know, I know that they won't deny that either. But it, it's, you know, in modalism, it's just kind of in what form was he in. And, you know, we have evidence from Scripture. John 17, 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. And again, you use these words, self, himself, myself. It's persons. Those are people. I mean, those are, those are pronouns you use as, as dealing with a person. Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. There's a distinction between Jesus, who was speaking on this earth as a man, saying that he was with God, the Father, before the world was created, right? Before, before any creation, he was there. And he says that. So there was already that distinction going back to prior to the creation. 
we also have John 1.1, 1, 1, of course, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right, from all we going back from the beginning. And that's Jesus Christ, the Word is made manifest. So the, the distinctions have been there eternally. It's not something that just created, and it's not something with the man, Christ Jesus, because Jesus Christ didn't become a man when he was, you know, I don't believe that he was flesh in heaven with God. I mean, he existed, of course, distinctly, but not in a body, not in a physical body um, at that time. So we're in John chapter 14. We see there, there's so much I could go into. I'm, I'm really going to try to, to stay focused on a few issues that, I, that I've seen come up that, that people who have been gravitating towards this oneness idea have been stuck on, so for lack of a better term, just kind of a sticking point. Well, what about this? Well, what about this, verse? right? What, well, what do you, how do you answer this? Isaiah 9, 6, 1, we're going to get to that a little bit later, kind of near the end of the sermon. But here's another one. And um, let's start reading again in John 14. We'll start reading at verse number one. The Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. So this is one of those areas. Well, here, let's just read the next two verses. Verse number eight, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Jesus is proving a point. He's trying to enlighten Thomas. He's trying to, to show him something. And in his statement, and we're going to get to, because, see, the problem is when you stop right here at this, at just at stop at this verse, you don't look at other scriptures, and you don't keep reading the explanation behind how what he's saying is true, because that's what the rest of the passage does. It explains how that's true. If you just stop here, you could say, and that's what, the, what, pe what some people would like to do, is just say, well, see, Jesus is the Father because of his answer here. Now, if that is what he was saying here, then you have a contradiction in Scripture. And keep your finger here. We, we looked at this this morning. Look at John chapter 5. Because before you get to John 14, you've got to read John chapter 5, which is also Jesus Christ speaking. Verse number 36. And remember, because the story in John 14, Philip says, hey, show us the Father. Right? And it sufficeth us. And Jesus says, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Have I been with you so long a time and have you not known me? And the people want to say, well, he is the Father then. Look at what Jesus himself said then in John 5, verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him you believe not. Now, when he's talking to these people, he says, you have n neither heard his voice nor seen his shape. If Jesus was the Father, that would not be an accurate statement. He's standing right in front of him. How could he say you haven't seen his shape? Well, either this passage in John 5 means something else, or John 14 means something other than Jesus Christ is the Father. Because at any time did he say, I am the Father? Never. 
Never. And I brought this point up this morning is that, you know, we don't have to believe on uh, that the, the Father died on the cross and paid for our sins. We have to believe on the Son, the Son of God. Over and over again, it's faith on the Son of God. And I didn't do a word count on this, but you'll probably find, and, and again, I'm, I don't know this for sure, but at least as often, if not more, you'll find believe on Jesus. You'll say believe on the Son of God. He that believeth on the Son of God hath eternal life. You're going to find that terminology and reference to Jesus, I think, more often than his actual name, Jesus Christ. Because you're believing on the Son. And the Son is not the Father. They're, they're two distinct. Now, they're both God, yes, as part of the triune God, one God, but definitely distinct in their persons. Now, um, turn, if you would, to Genesis 32. Genesis 32. We're going to come back to John 14. I don't know if you already lost your place there because we're going to get ultimately to the rest of that passage to understand what that is saying in context. But the fact that no one has seen God is found in multiple places in Scripture. And when I say God, God the Father. So uh, this is a habit that, that, it's not necessarily a bad habit, but as I'm trying to teach clarity about the doctrine of the Trinity, be aware of this. I might slip and, and you know, because the Bible does the same thing. So in my efforts to be really clear, I might slip, but it's not necessarily incorrect. So when I say God, as the Bible does, God can sometimes be referring to one person of the, of the Trinity or all three of them. It, it's used both ways in the Bible, just the phrase God. So when you're a reference to God can go, so when the Bible says that no one has seen God, we're going to see references to seeing God the Father. Has anyone seen God the Father? The Father aspect, uh, part of the Trinity. Genesis 32 we're going to see verse number 30. Uh, the Bible says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So here we believe that that was a, an Old Testament showing of Jesus Christ that wrestled with Jacob. That's what I believe. And he's, the, but the reason why I even go to this, this scripture is because he's making a point to say, Wow, I saw God face to face, and I'm still alive. Like I'm still around. Okay, that in and of itself, this is, this is supporting scripture. This is, not this is not hardcore evidence. Okay, we're going to get to more hardcore evidence. Uh, turn, if you would, to Exodus 33. I'm going to read for you also another, just a little supporting evidence from another story in scripture from Judges 13. Verse 21, the Bible says, But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and his, to his wife. That, then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. So in both of these stories, we see people that have this, this notion in their head that if you see God, you're going to die. That's what, this, is, this is what's going on. So why would these people be so scared as to think they're going to die if they saw God? It's not just for no reason. It's not just because they made this up in their minds. Exodus 33 has the answer. Look at verse number 17. Exodus 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So now Moses is asking to see the glory of God. He wants to see God. He says, I know you by name. He always, he's friends with God, according to God. And he says, I want to see your glory. Verse 19, it says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Very clear, clear statement to make doctrine on, right? If any man sees the face of what's being referred to as the Lord in this, in this sentence. And again, I believe even the Lord can be used just as God is used to refer to different elements of the Godhead. But did people see Jesus Christ face to face? 
Yes, they did. I believe even Jacob did. He saw God face to face when he saw Jesus Christ. But no man can see the Father face to face and live. And that's why these people are kind of freaking out going, we saw God, we're going to die. Right? Because God himself said, the Lord said this. Verse 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now, if Jesus Christ is the Father, if there is no, I mean, how could, how can this, you know, did he change his mind then and now I'm going to allow people to see my face and not die? I mean, that would be silly. Well, what reason would we have to even think that? Even in the New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Another reference to God the Father. No one has seen him. And it's referring to his face. Moses saw his hinder parts, but no one has actually seen the face of God the Father. John chapter 6. You can turn there if you like, if you're, in, if you're close to John anyways. Turn to John chapter 6. Because we'll see, again, out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ doesn't contradict himself. Verse number 43, John chapter 6. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. So, Again, where is the preponderance of evidence lying as far as seeing the Father? Every example we're going to find is that no one's seen the Father. Yet we have one verse where Jesus is trying to explain, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And people want to take that verse and just say, well, see, Jesus is the Father. No, that's not what he's saying at all. I'll read for you 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. This is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So how could they have seen the Father in Jesus? Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And then we're going to go back to John 14. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible reads, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ was the express image of the per and I, I pointed this out this morning, of his person. God the Father's person. Yes, there are three persons in one God. I have no problem using that term person because right here we have an express image of God the Father's person is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that image. He, when you see Jesus Christ, that is that you're seeing the image of God the Father. So when, when Philip looks at Jesus, or Thomas, excuse me, when Thomas looks at Jesus, he, can, he should see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because they're identical. They look identical as far as being the image of his Father. But not just that. Let's, go, let's, just, read what he, let's just read what Jesus said in John 14 after he says this because he, he doesn't stop there. He expounds on it a little bit further. He gives a little bit more information so he understands what he's talking about. Just like when he said, 
uh, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? Do you remember when Jesus said that? You have no power in the kingdom of heaven. You know, he, he was using really strong language. But then what do you do? He goes on to explain that a little bit. You can't just stop at, the one, at one statement, especially when, you know, when, he, when he's explaining it even further. So we have this statement here. Let's reread here, verse number nine. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. When you're looking at Jesus, you are looking at the Father in the sense that the Father is in Jesus. The Father dwells within Jesus Christ. He is in him. They are still separate, but he is in him. And when you look at Jesus, you can very well be looking at the Father. In, I mean, this is what he's saying. This is what he said. Well, don't you, don't you believe that the Father is in me? If you've seen me, you've seen my works, the works that I'm doing is because of the Father that's in me. The Father is giving me the power to do all these works. That's what he, I mean, that's what he says. So in looking at me and seeing me, you're seeing the Father, the manifestation of the Father in the sense of I'm doing everything that the Father told me to do. I'm doing all the work that God has me. I'm, I'm under the power and the command and the authority of God the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen him because he's completely representing God the Father. It's not that hard to understand, really. I mean, it's, if, you, if you want it to mean something else, then it might, it might throw you for a loop. But when we look at all the rest of Scripture, and it's evident that no man could see the Father. You know, I mean, it doesn't take that much to prove this to, to be you know, just a misunderstanding if you're, if you're saying that, well, that just means that Jesus Christ is the Father. No. The Father is in him. And, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more, too. Turn, if you would, to... Um, well, here, before, before I... Um, I just want to show you one, one more verse in John 14. We're done there. In verse 20, it says, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Jesus is in the Father. The Father is in Jesus, but it doesn't say that the Father is Jesus or Jesus is the Father. They dwell in each other. Now, 1 John chapter 4. Please turn there. And I brought up the example this morning. I'm going to use it again this evening in regards to the Trinity and, and, and using an analogy of ourselves, our person being body, soul, and spirit as a good example or a good way to understand the concept of how there can be a triune God where us being one person have three parts that make us up. But again, like I said, the analogy, the example, the illustration falls short at some level because we're talking about an eternal existent God that is, is, is hard to even comprehend in our mind all of the attributes that God has because we have a finite mind. So think about this. We have a soul and a spirit that dwells in us, in our flesh, right? That is literally dwelling within us. So in a way, it's kind of like, if you've seen me, you've seen my soul, or you've seen my spirit. It's an image. You're seeing the body, right? But God, the Father, is in Jesus, and Jesus is in the Father. It kind of goes both, you know, both directions with God as far as the dwelling within one another, which I'm not sure that the body is the perfect representation of, of the spirit and soul all dwelling within each other. I, I mean, because the body is going to be separated, you know, and the flesh is going to be here, and our soul and spirit are going to be out. You know, so there, there's some separation stuff there in that, in that regard. But it's still another, another way of thinking about it, because the word dwelling or living in um, is really what's going on with God. Verse number 12 of 1 John chapter 4, the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. 
And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we, we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. This is very similar wording to what we saw with, with Jesus being in the Father and the Father in him. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. We see some more wording like this. I, I want to go through a few of these references to, to help you to, to kind of sink in and understand what is going on here. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 12, the Bible reads, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Talking about Jesus, of course. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now, again, another verse that's talking about the whole, you know, the Godhead dwelled, abode, existed with Jesus Christ, a full Godhead existed with him bodily. That, I mean, that's not saying that he is the same as the Father or the Holy Spirit, but they're all dwelling in one together. It's those th <laughs> three in one because there's one God. God was dwelling bodily in the form of Jesus Christ. You can see that what he was doing, he, Jesus Christ himself was even saying, I do this by the power of, of God or by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, like, I mean, he was doing these things through their power. And he was with them in one God. <laughs> I, I, it, it, sometimes it sounds kind of funny because it, 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 it's a little bit different than what um, we physically deal with on this world in, in a sense, but it's really not that complicated. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Um, are you still, you're in 1 John, right? That's where I had, or no, you're in Colossians. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. I'll read for you from 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 14. The Bible says, That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to him be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, I heard some people trying to explain this verse, and I'm thinking, like, I'm literally thinking, are you even saved to not understand what this verse is saying? And, and look, if, if, if you're saved and you have a problem with a verse like this, you know, I'm not just trying to berate you, but I'm talking about, like, people who are supposed to be teachers of God's law. And um, it, it's so evidently talking about here, you know, because what they're saying is that Jesus Christ, I, I think what they said was that no man hath seen him or something. You know, it was, it was really bizarre when they're trying to, to make Jesus be the Father. But Jesus is dwelling, verse 16 is saying in 1 Timothy 6, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man could approach unto, is because he's dwelling in God the Father. The light, the glory. That's what the glory means. It's like a shining. So when Moses asked, is he the glory of God? That's the light which no man can approach unto. He says, no man can see me and live. 
and whom no man hath seen nor can see in verse 16. It's very, it's very clear when it talks about Jesus Christ, it's, it's talking about him dwelling with the Father in that regard, and then it describes the Father. So um, the Bible also says, and here's, here's one of the dangers, and this is something that I, that I, that I thought of, of, of why this doctrine is, is really gets really bad. One reason. There's many reasons, but... When you start taking this to its end, if you start thinking, because you see all these verses about God dwelling in Jesus and Jesus dwelling in God and stuff, the Bible also says that we dwell with him and we will be one with God, right? Just, Jesus said, that, you know, Father, as, as I am with you and you with me, so they will be in us, right? But what they're doing is they're taking this concept of Jesus dwelling with God and then making him the Father, right? Jesus dwelling with the Father and then him being the Father. Well, then you'd have to do the same thing with these other scriptures that us dwelling with Jesus would somehow make us Jesus or make us the Father. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like when, you, when you start blending them together like that and you use this language as being used, well, the, the Father in me and I in you. No, they're still distinct. They're dwelling in each other, but they're still distinct. And just like we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, the Holy Spirit, if you're saved today, the, the, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. That doesn't make you the Holy Spirit <laughs> by, no, by no stretch of the imagination. Jesus Christ was, is in you if you're saved. That doesn't make you Jesus Christ. God the Father dwells in Jesus and Jesus dwells in the Father, but, but they're still distinct and separate. John 8, 19 says, Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And the reason why I'm bringing up this verse, you're still in 1 John chapter 2, is because when we believe on Jesus, it's a package deal as far as the Godhead is concerned. You can't have one without the other. It doesn't make them the same. Jesus doesn't have to be the father, but... You can't believe on the Father and not believe on the Son. You can't believe on the Son and not believe on the Father. It's, it's critical to our belief system and even in our salvation. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to understand all of the Godhead, but you can't accept one and reject the other. I mean, you have, you have to have both because that's what they were trying to do. They're trying to say that, you know, the Pharisees are trying to say, oh, well, we believe in God. We believe in the Father. We believe in Job, but we don't believe in you. And, and, and Jesus saying, well, you can't, you can't have one without the other. Now, even though there are these, these distinctions and distinct persons within the Godhead, it doesn't mean that, that you, can, you can separate them out from being God. I mean, it's, it's one God, and it's a package deal. So in 1 John 2.22, the Bible says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. They go together. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which, I, which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now, uh, before, before I forget, because it just came into my memory, one of the places where I did mispreach or misteach was back where we started in John 14, where it says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And I had, I had said that Jesus is a father. Now, look, no one brought this to my attention or anything like that. I'm just saying because I'm trying to be honest in my teaching. And the way that I said that Jesus was a father, I just said, I just kind of blew it off. It's just like, well, because they're three in one. And that was my explanation for it. So I don't think I was, it's one of those things where it's not like it was the worst thing, you know, just, just way off but it was just kind of a not really thinking too hard about what he's saying and what's being taught here of just saying that it's all just God. And um, you may say, well, you were right to say, I, I, don't, I don't think so. But um, anyways, I just want to be as clear as I can. And when I'm teaching stuff, especially when I'm putting stuff out on the internet, you know, I want to, if I see somewhere where I think I'm an error, I'm going to try to correct that. So um, that was one place. And then... Turn, if you go to John chapter 8, because this is another important point that I think can be a, a sticking point for some people. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is a real famous passage where 
um, I think three, at least three times in this, in this chapter, I believe it's three times, Jesus said, I am he. Right? If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Very powerful. Proving the deity of Jesus Christ and who he's claiming to be. Right? He's claiming to be God because he's saying, I am he. And um, John 8, look at verse number 24. The Bible says, I said therefore unto you, that you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said, saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Again, drawing the distinction between himself and the Father. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. Just showing the, the submission, the obedience of the Son to the Father. I do nothing of myself. Verse 37. Jump down to verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. How could you not see the clear distinctions as we're reading these chapters? I mean, it's evident. Verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Jump down to verse number 54. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 43. <clears throat> They were upset because Jesus Christ was claiming to be I am. He said, you, you have to believe that I am he. When, when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, who did he say should send him? He said, I am that I am. I am hath sent you. I mentioned this this morning. I'll bring it up again tonight. Part of the problem, I think part of the confusion is when you're reading the Bible, being able to consider that there may be one person of the Godhead speaking or they may be speaking in reference to all three at the same time. And the only way you're going to know that is, is in some cases, is just by really studying it and just trying to figure out what's being said. Some cases are very obvious. When Jesus is referring to God, he's, he's obviously referring to the Father even though God could be a very generic term to refer to all three. The Lord is also a term that can be used in reference to all three. So, but when you read the Old Testament, and I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I, you, you, I've always had this image of just God the Father just always being the one speaking. It's just always the way that I've read it. But it's not necessarily an accurate way of looking at it because there are three parts of God and, and God, you know, 
while, while I still think that the father probably is the one who's, who's doing the majority of the speaking, it's not always the case. And it's definitely not always the case. And Jesus being I am, I think just refers to him being God. I don't think that that's, that's um, specific to any one member of the Godhead. I think that's just God. Where you say, I am he, I'm God. Um, Isaiah 43, though, we're going to see another reference here. And this, and this is one, Isaiah's got a lot of, of course, foreshadowing and, and um, prophecies of Jesus Christ to come. Isaiah 43, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba. Now, that phrase, the Holy One of Israel, many times is referring specifically to Jesus Christ being the Holy One of Israel, like the Holy One from Israel. I'm not saying that every single time that that phrase is used, it's, it's, it's specifically going to always be talking about him because God in general could be the Holy One of Israel, but, but Jesus Christ um, is. And, and I think that when we read this, because this is a, a, a passage I always love going to, and I still will, to prove the deity of Jesus Christ to Jehovah's Witnesses and things like that. But um, again, looking at this, let's just read it. Let's jump down to verse number 10, Isaiah 43. Bible says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. So there's again that reference to I am he, just like Jesus said in John chapter 8. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And this is you know, one very good example when it says the Lord. I don't think that that's just talking about God the Father. When he says, beside me there is no Savior. Now, I think that's talking about God, the Godhead. Because the Godhead is the Savior. Just as, you know, Jesus is, saves just as much as him that sent him, like John 5, 24. If you believe, believe on him that, he that believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Just like you believe on Jesus for everlasting life. Why? Because they are still one God and, and there is that, that lack of separation between them being one God, even though there's three persons. So you can't, you can't believe on the Father without believing on the Son. You can't believe on one without the other. You, you, need, you need both. They have to be there. And, and it's, it's, almost, it's almost like, you know, even though Jesus isn't the Father, you're, you're inherently accepting that when you accept the Word, the Word of God, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ coming forth from God. You're accepting the deal, the package, the, the source of the Godhead. And what we see here when you, when you really try to, to fine tune it and, 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 speak, and nail it down, I believe that when I say in the Lord here, I'm talking about the Godhead. I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles, and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Now, there are shared attributes also within the Godhead. I mean, there's, we, we already looked at some of the, a lot of the distinctions this morning, but you have a, lot, a wide range of shared attributes that all three possess. And you don't want to be, you don't want to make the mistake of, of associating because you see one particular attribute or one thing spoken of one of the members of the Godhead, that it's necessarily that member because if it's shared between all three, then it could be any of them. If that makes sense to you, I hope it does. Turn if you go to Isaiah 9 now. I'm going I'm to cover Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, 6. I love this passage. We've covered, we've covered quite a bit of ground on just, you know, Jesus not being the Father. I don't believe that he is the Father. We see that no man has seen the Father anytime. There's definitely a distinction. While there is one God, 
Just like there's, there's one David Burzens. I have a body, soul, and spirit. My soul is not my spirit. My spirit is not my flesh. But there's still one me. There's one God. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. But they all three are one. Um, so when we read Isaiah 9, 6, people always like to turn to this now. I've, I've been hearing this more recently. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Very clearly, no one's going to deny this is talking about Jesus Christ being born. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And what people want to do, again, to me, this is the James 2 of the Trinity. This is the, 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 the monkey wrench that, that, well, how do you even understand this? Because it says right there that Jesus is the Father. And that's not what it says. So we'll be honest, that's not what it says. And I've had so I, I received an email recently of someone saying, Do you believe with the prophet that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace? And then do you believe with the, with the prophet Isaiah that Jesus Christ is the Father? But see, what he's meaning when he says that is not what this verse is meaning. And it's and it's a trick question. It's one that just just to, you know it's set up in a way to make you have a wrong answer no matter what you say. What this says is his name shall be called. And it lists off names. That's what it says. So it says his name shall be called. The Bible says his name shall be called Emmanuel. Right? Now did did was that what people were calling him? No, they're calling him Jesus, right? Was Emmanuel mean God with us? All, name, all names given in the Bible carry a meaning. Names are actually very important in, in Scripture. And you read about all names. People chose names carefully, names of places, names of people. You know, they all were given, you know, God giving names. They all carry a meaning in a very specific purpose. You know, there's a, there's a whole point to giving someone a name. So when it says here that the Son is, you know, and his name shall be called wonderful, first of all, it's not saying that People are going around and saying, hey, wonderful, to Jesus Christ, you know, or especially like if he's sitting on a throne. You don't, you don't, that's not the name they call him, but the reason why he's given these names is because they describe him. Right? I mean, it makes sense. Wonderful is an attribute of Jesus Christ. Just as much as counselor, mighty God. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ is, and it, and it perfectly describes him to call him an everlasting father. But I don't think that this is referring to the Godhead of the Father. His name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Think about this now. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Okay. So I'm going to explain it. And I don't think this requires a whole lot of explanation, but ju just a little food for thought so this doesn't trip you up, because it shouldn't trip you up. Jesus Christ is a father. Now, first of all, is Jesus Christ everlasting? Yes, of course. Right? So that, that part of the name, the everlasting, no problem there. Right? Of course he's everlasting. We know this. He's, he has no beginning, no ending. But what about that father part? Well, read, let's read 1 Corinthians 4. And, and uh, Did I say 4 or 14? Because I want you in 4. I apologize for that. Go to chapter 4. When you're born again, who is your father? Who is it that begat you? Well, the Bible teaches that the, the word of God is conceived in our heart and we're born again, right? Who is the word of God? Jesus is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, verse number 14. The Bible says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons. Wait, who's writing this? Oh yeah, the Apostle Paul. But as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. 
people that the apostle Paul led to Christ, didn't he just call him them his sons? Wouldn't that make that him their father? Well, we know when we're born again that we're sons of God, right? The Bible says so. But as many as receive them, again, them give you power to become the sons of God, even though they believe on his name. So you see how people could be referred to as a father, just as Jesus is referred to as a father. The Apostle Paul is being referred to as a father, spiritually speaking. Now, did he have a part in their salvation and in their new birth? Yes, he did. Was it his seed that brought them forth? No. But is he still considered a father? Yes. God the Father is referred to as God the Father because Jesus is, is the Son. That's why that name of God the Father applies to the Father. That's why it makes sense. Because you have a Son and a Father. That makes perfect sense. But Jesus Christ having a name, uh, an attribute, being known as a father, there's nothing wrong with that. Is he everlasting? Yes. Is he a father? Yes. We're his children. We're also his brethren. The Apostle Paul, these people that got saved were his children. They're also his brethren. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. This is how, I mean, it, make, it, it can make perfect sense. It doesn't have to be some big dilemma. It doesn't have to be some big problem. Now, I under, believe me, I understand why people get confused on that and, and look at that, and your first thought is thinking, well, then Jesus is the Father. Because you read that. I, I get that. Look, I was wrong on this passage before. And again, I just kind of chalked it up to just being, well, the three are one. And that was just kind of my, my, my just quick answer. Well, it's because the three are one. But I don't, I, I don't think that's, that's accurate, I think, what he's saying here. I think it's just describing him just as much as he's, you know, he's wonderful, he's a counselor, he's a you know, prince of peace, he's the everlasting father, but it doesn't mean that he's God the father, so to speak. It's not the same thing. Everything works just fine, and, and you, you, don't, you, do, you don't have to like, you know, strain and twist and rest scriptures to make this work. It's actually found pretty pretty frequently as far as the concepts of having spiritual fathers, spiritual brothers, right? And, and, and having that relationship and Jesus Christ being a father. Like I said, literally, in a sense of you receiving the word of God, which Jesus is the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by Jesus. Amen. On Jesus, in Jesus, Jesus in us, we have new life generated from that. But you notice how people who are involved in the birthing process can also be called father. As the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was calling himself a father to these spiritual children. It wasn't his seed, yet he's still, in a sense, their father. Okay? Okay. But he's not God the Father. <laughs> Another thing, very along these same exact lines where, where the answer is kind of inherent to this, I, I had another email that, that said, and, um, in Luke, I'll just read this before you don't have to turn, Luke 1, talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? When she was told that she was going to bring forth a son. How, how is that going to happen? I, you know, I'm... I haven't, known, I haven't known anybody. I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So what this person was trying to implicate, say, well, see, it was the Holy Ghost. So wouldn't the Holy Ghost be the Father? And they're just trying to make this oneness. Right? They're just trying to say, well, the Holy Ghost is the Father. No. Did the Holy Ghost take part in the birth of Jesus Christ? Yes. Did God the Father take part in the birth of Jesus Christ? Yes. Did Jesus play part in the birth of Jesus Christ? Yes, they all three did. In a sense, if you want to call the Holy Ghost Father, just as the Apostle Paul could be called Father spiritually, okay. But it's not the same as the Holy Ghost being 
the other part of the Godhead, the Father, that, that he's known as, that, that, that we call him the Father, right? I mean, it's a, it's a name that carries meaning, but it doesn't make them the same person. Just trying, to, trying to find the, the terminology of the persons. I'm going to keep using that, 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 that um, the word, a person. And it's also similar to the arguments about who created the world. I'm not going to go into all the details on that, but um, you know, you read scripture, you could see Jesus created the world, or you could see, you know, God the Father references as being, you know, creating the world. Well, the answer is yes. They both were in used in the in the the creation. I mean, it's the same way of saying like, if I um, if someone asks me to do something and then I delegate that job to someone else, to like one of my children or to my wife, they can say that they did the job, but I can also say that I did the job because I got it done. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's the same way that you lead someone to Christ. You got them saved. That's why we say, how many people did you get saved today? I got this many people saved because you took part in their salvation. Now, are you their savior? No. But did you lead them to Christ? Yeah. Did you get that person saved? Yeah. Did Jesus get that person saved? Yeah. Did God the Father get that person saved? Yeah. Did the Holy Spirit get that person saved? Yeah. Not a dilemma. Not a problem. I'll close on this. A doctrine like this, and I, and I, I kind of mentioned this at the end of my sermon this morning, but you can know doctrines by their fruits. When you have doctrines that are believed exclusively by unbelievers, like it's pretty safe to say that their doctrine is wrong just based on the fruit of who's believing it. So when you have a cult, you know, JWs or Mormons, they're like the only ones that don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Right? Or may, there's probably some other fringe I don't even know about. But like, as a whole, it's like, they're the only ones. It's easy to say, well, they're wrong on that because they're just clearly not even saved anyways and they're the only ones that believe that. So they're not just coming up with correct scripture all on their own that nobody else believes. But when you have shared doctrines between believers and maybe apostate religions, right? Like the Catholic Church, for example. It doesn't make the doctrine false. Just because some of the things that we believe from the Bible, Catholics believe, or Pentecostals believe, or some other group believes, it doesn't just make, it doesn't say, well, just throw that doctrine out then, because you'd be throwing out a lot of good stuff, a lot of true things, if you took that approach. The Catholics believe that Jesus was sinless. Am I Catholic because I believe that too? The Catholics believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Well, guess what? I believe that too. Does that make me Catholic? Does that, does that, make, does that make what they believe wrong? No. But here's the thing with this oneness stuff is that it is believed like pretty much exclusively by the Pentecostals who are not saved. That alone should tell you, be big red flag. Why is nobody else in like that, that are saved? Why is no one else teaching this stuff? You, you get into some very shaky territory when you start thinking you're coming up with all this brand new doctrine. There's nothing new under the sun. People of, I mean, every, but believers have, still have the same Holy Spirit residing within them and the same word of God that's been preserved for us, I mean, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. The new revelations ended with revelation. I do believe that he, just human beings in general have maybe been growing a little bit more in their knowledge and wisdom the longer they've been able to study and kind of learn and build on a foundation. Sure. But you're not just coming up with some whole brand new thing. It's still going to be 
built on, on the same principles, the same truths. The doctrine of the Trinity is pretty foundational. As we saw in the book of, I mean, just read the whole book of 1 John. I mean, you can't have one without the other, but they are definitely distinct. I mean, if, if it's all just one, why would, why even, what the point to even bring up the Father and the Son? There would be no purpose to it. They have to be distinct. And it's very clear. Hopefully, uh, you know, I'm just going to close with this. If, if anyone has any other questions, you know, everyone here should know me well enough by now that, like, you can ask me whatever you'd like. We could talk about any doctrine. I don't want there to be confusion. Unfortunately, when, you know, a lot of times, you know, the people who have been pushing this stuff, the heretics that have been pushing this stuff, they did their job in causing all kinds of confusion in many areas. And I don't know how far, if it, if it has reached to here or not, I hope not. But the confusion has been spread and it has been undermining the faith of some. And I've seen it firsthand. And that's one of the reasons why I'm even bringing this stuff up. And, um, you know, if, if you go back and listen to any of my old sermons where I touch maybe on some of these, I'm just going to warn you now, I might not have said the exact accurate thing. And that's why I'm, I'm just making it a point to cover it. Now, I'm going to go back and correct what I believe I said incorrectly or in error before from my old sermons. I'm going to make those corrections because I don't want to be any source of confusion for anybody. I don't think it was just that way far off. And if you listen to the whole sermons, you'll, 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 you'll get what I'm, I mean, where I stand on the issues. It's just I made some, uh, I did make some errors. So um, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the truths from your word. God, I pray that you would please um, just bless our church, bless everyone here tonight, dear God. Pray that you please open up our, our ears and our minds to, to wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we love you. We, we thank you for saving our souls. We want to know more about you. I pray that you please just help our, our finite uh, created minds to understand um, um, you to the extent that you want us to understand you, dear Lord, and that uh, you, you just help us to do what's right, help us to continue to serve you and to do... Um, to do what you have laid out for us to do. Help us to know what that is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.